Welcome to this episode of Against the Mountains of Badness. I'm Jason Rennie. And I'm John Wright. And on this episode, we're going to be chatting science fiction, and we're going to talk about the horror of utopia. So, John, utopias, aren't they normally a good thing? The word utopia comes from <laughs> Thomas More's book of the same name, and it means nowhere. It means no place. Uh, because a utopia is something that, by definition, can't exist. It's a daydream. What a utopia yeah. is basically is it's a man-made uh, garden of paradise. It's a man-made uh, New Jerusalem. And the idea is that if only we humans got our institutions correct, we could cure all sorrow, sickness, and sin. And, I mean, the basic idea uh, of a utopia is kind of sarcastic because I have the theory, which I think you share, that mm -hmm. all utopias are really dysutopias. Because the idea that... that you can be human and have human flaws and live in a utopia where all flaws are cured by the enlightened uh, rules that they have is kind of a silly idea. But mm -hmm. a lot of books have been written, a lot of science fiction books have been written that seem to indicate that if the progress we have made in things like uh, eliminating slavery or giving women the right to vote or other things where we've made social changes that seems to have created... Um, improvement in the human condition uh the idea that the progress will continue uh, uninterrupted in an ever upwards uh slant and then when men become like gods we will turn our genius to solving the problems of sociology and psychology all human psychological flaws will be unearthed and they will be cured by means of a giant games machine or something ridiculous uh we'll just put the the perfection helmets on our heads and then we'll all be we'll all be perfect little uh, little robots in Utopia or something. That, I mean, that's I mean, I myself think that all Utopias are actually dystopias, are actually I nightmares agree. in in disguise. Um, but the allure of a future that is a shining future, I myself wrote a book called The Golden Age, where I said that the future was going to be just filled with all sorts of luxuries and uh, and inventions that are unimaginable that would be make us it would seem godlike to our to to us now. The same way. What we can do now, honestly, would seem godlike to someone from thousands of years ago. This we can fly it. through the air. Uh, we don't you know. appreciate. We don't appreciate the absolute insane luxury we are um, surrounded by. Well, uh, consider that the Pharaoh of Egypt, when he had a headache, just had to grin and bear it. He could not go down to the Seven Eleven and buy himself an aspirin. I was going to say, yeah. what would what would the what would the rulers of the Middle Ages make of a Seven Eleven? where they have ice cream in boxes frozen any time of year ready to go <laughs> what would Food they just make of the, of the of the plate glass window wow. which is as smooth and pure as the as the sky uh, the, all the paper plates are perfectly round and you can throw them away after eating <laughs> off of them all the printing on everything on all the packages is microscopic and absolutely pure uh if they took out a a roll of uh of uh, you know a tissue paper or something it had little designs on it they would go what scribe made all these little f blue <laughs> flowers over and over again you know mm. on this uh, on this piece of paper uh to, just to blow my own horn for a second i have a scene in um one of my books whose the name of it escapes me at the moment where merle the magician wakes up in the modern day and is astonished by things like street lamps and uh uh and and uh, horseless carriages but also by things like uh, the fact that people sit down at the table and they don't notice where the salt shaker is because some people sit above or below the salt, according to, <laughs> and that all the silverware is 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 perfect, is is a uh, is identical, you know, for mm -hmm. everyone sitting at, sitting at the table and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. You see, so yes, we have a lot of luxuries, uh, which uh, have corrupted us uh, terribly. I'm ashamed to say, but uh, and I wish it were not the case. See, all oh, if we lived in a utopia, yeah. we could have the luxury without the corruption. All we have to well, do is change the uh, change the laws. Now you, you have to correct me. Am I wrong in saying a utopia is the proposition that changing laws and customs would perfect mankind? And if it's not that, what is it? Because I think that's I, what it is, but I'm not sure. I would argue. Um, I would argue. So at least in terms of um, the political utopias of the Marxist or the fascist or mm -hmm. or even the libertarian. To some degree um essentially well they're all christian heresies they all want to build heaven they want to build heaven on earth but leaving leaving that aside mm -hmm. um all of them 
So the, the Christian answer is man is a sinner and needs to repent. They need they need Jesus and to yeah. come back to God. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the Christian answer. But for all of the political isms, they don't want to say that. They say the solution is always some external technique. If we get this technique right, then we will perfect man. Whether What that technique is, like do we institute Sharia law? Do we give the proletariat the means of production? Um, do we put the women in charge? Um, do we go wildly ecologically green in some fashion and have solar panels everywhere? I thought mm. that's probably a little crude, but I mean, you get the like. It's some ex like if we can just right. educate people correctly, if we can just some external technique, then we will perfect them, and then everything will be perfect, and we will have heaven on earth. I think that's what utopias are driving at. It's it, right. it's always, but it's always some external technique will fix man, um, rather than man has to repent and give up his sinful ways. Utopia, um, in other words, what you just said is, if I if I understood you, utopia is using an external technique to solve an internal problem. Trying to, yeah, and that's why it doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> it's not going to work. No, of course. This is why it that's always why ends I say, in blood and That's fire. why I say all utopias are satire. Thomas More no. was a sat was a satirist, mm. and when people read his utopia. Uh, a lot of moderns can't understand what he was driving at, and they take him completely seriously because they think the things he was recommending would work and would be a great idea. You see, now let me let me mention something really really uh, fundamental to to your to your answer about utopia. The Christian worldview is that man has fallen; that we used hmm. to live in utopia called Eden; that we left it because of our own disobedience to God, our disobedience to the nature of the good. Even if you don't take the story of Eden literally, as I do, you can still say there's something in man's character that knows the good and, and rebelled against it. Okay, mm. We know we're stabbing ourselves in the foot. Mm. Shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, so the Christian worldview is how to get back to that original good. It's a fall and a rise again. Okay? No, We fell I off disagree. the horse, we've got to get back onto it. Basically, I disagree. Well, I don't, oh, you, you, don't, you don't think that's the, the Christian worldview is about reconciliation from a fall? No, it is, but we're not trying to get back to Eden. We're destined for somewhere much better than Eden. Oh yeah, the Beyond New Jerusalem. Eden. We're we're, we're the, headed for the New Jerusalem. Sure. The, the sure. new the New Jerusalem is not Eden. Like it's, it's not just a return to Eden. It's it's something much more than that. Certainly, certainly. Um, but just, it's a return. Just to be clear. I, okay. Yes, I see what you're saying. But yeah, yeah, but you're right. It's 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 it's. I, I don't think I don't think we disagree that much. <laughs> no, it, we disagree if, if all, only on terminology. But but let's let's contrast. Even if we did, let's say we did disagree, you and I, it would be sharply contrasted with the progressive worldview, the Hegelian worldview. Let us say the evolutionary worldview, which says that in the early days man was not living in Eden. Man was a a, a brute, was an ape. Man mm. was an ape, and before he was an ape, he was a a dinosaur. And before he was a dinosaur, he was a slime. Before he was a slime, he was a he was a chemical. Okay, mm. the. The progressive worldview, the Darwinian worldview, says that man progresses from slime to beast to, to beast man to man and then to superman. Mm. And that once we become superman, uh, we can create utopia at our will. We'll be, we'll be man like gods, and once we're gods, we can create godlike paradises. You say, mm. so there's no, there's no need for reconciliation in that worldview. It's merely a straight... Uh, ascent. We will fix that. <laughs> so, uh, in that worldview, the past has nothing to teach us because the future is always better than the past. Well, in that worldview, we don't have to be grateful to our ancestors. We don't have to respect our early ancestors. We don't. We don't need saving. We'll save ourselves by our own efforts. You see? Uh, how's that working out? Oh uh, well. <laughs> look at the world. I mean, what can I say? The We're not headed toward utopia. The 20th but, century was the bloodiest in history. So. Yeah, yeah. And the number of Christian martyrs in, nowadays is, is more than all the previous centuries combined. The time of the martyrs was not, was not early Rome. <laughs> it's now. No. Um, it's, uh, oh, what was I going to say? It's slightly amusing. Um, did you watch the Matrix films? Yes, I did. There's a, there's a scene where... Um, uh, Hugo Weaving's character, Agent Smith, Agent Smith, is saying, "Yes, we, 
and initially we put you humans in a paradise where everything was perfect and you all went insane and couldn't deal with it so we had to put you in we had to put you in this real world where you couldn't function um yeah. and hmm, you, they might have been onto something oh yeah also, that's the one that's the one the one true thing in that movie that comes through uh also amusingly um i saw a meme recently uh speaking of the matrix they said uh in the film the matrix uh, 1999 the society of 1999 was regarded as the pinnacle of uh, human society and the highest point it ever reached and looking around over the last 23 years since then they might have been onto something <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> but um anyway uh so back to utopia we so have... 1999 was the utopia because it was after it was after the cold war was over but before the global war on terror and the oh. current uh, 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 civil cold war of, of uh, woke versus uh, Christian, what's going well, on in the world around us? It could uh, be. You could, uh, sadly, so utopias, right. I say, are always slightly sarcastic because they're based on a false model. They're based on yeah. this model of, 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 of progress, of that things will just get better. Um, and you spoke of the, uh, the politics of it. Mm. And uh, I mentioned that the, the politics always think you're going to use a technique, an yep. external technique, let's call it the one ring of power. That you're going to use the, the wandering <laughs> of power to change men's, the laws and customs to cure mankind. Now, so here's the biggest difference between the two worldviews, between the progressive worldview and the Christian worldview. The Christian worldview, there's something wrong with man. Our nature mm -hmm. is bad. We have original sin, you see. The idea of original mm -hmm. sin is very offensive to progressives because it sounds like you're condemning a man as guilty just by being born. Well, the only thing man is <laughs> condemned to by being born is mortality. Okay. Mm. But we were not meant for mortality. At least that's what the Christians say. No, we were meant. We were meant for eternity. Yep. So that craving for eternity is still present, and in my opinion, the progressive desire for eternity is is the idea of an eternal progress. They just want to get there without without God. But they think that what's gone wrong is the evolution has not been completed. You see, it's not that we're wrong. It's just that we haven't. We're not supermen yet. We're not there yet. We're still too apish. We're we're halfway between ape man and superman. Okay, so they just think it's the institutions. Marx thinks it's it's. Let me just say it's kind of a conspiracy theory worldview. Marx thinks the devil is not original sin. He doesn't think it's mankind's nature that makes us the world filled with suffering and sorrow and injustice and poverty. He thinks these things are caused by institutional errors, that that by by capitalism, basically, mm -hmm. or by the family structure. So he blames the capitalists for the evils of the world. And he goes further than that. The reason why it becomes a conspiracy theory is because uh, he thinks the ills of the world are contrived by the architects of the world, by the, by the capitalist class that created the capitalist era, uh, in order to benefit themselves at the expense of their fellow man. Okay, that, that was a deliberate trick, like the Matrix. He, he thinks the capitalists made the Matrix to fool everyone into a false world where they will work and we will, and the capitalists will get the benefit of their of their labor. Okay, that's the idea. Now you can see this same idea repeated again and again in many other different, uh, in many other different political utopian uh, idealists, yep. ideologues. Yep. The Nazis exactly. thought the Jews were the, were the were the big devil because they were fighting the Bolsheviks, many of whom were Jewish, just by the way. Though they were atheist Jews, they weren't they weren't practicing Jews. They weren't real Jews. Um, the uh, the feminists feel the same way about masculinity. They, they think it's a social construct, an artificial, uh, uh, that it was part of laws and customs uh, enacted to to if exploit we, women and to disadvantage. If we them. overthrow the patriarchy, that will fix everything. It will fix everything. It's so if you think technique. original sin, each of these different political uh, uh, opinions is a variation on a theme. The theme is that original sin is caused by, not by the devil, not by Eve, but by some group in the society, usually a hidden group and very powerful, you know, the, 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 the matrix, the hidden group of power, once they're overthrown, the, the utopia will naturally, will naturally arise, will naturally come about. It will be, will just be evolved into existence. And the only That's thing hindering the evolution is evil men who are trying to stop it. So, I mean, in terms of, in terms of the theory, it's, it's uh, almost childlike in how innocent and naive it is. It just says all the evils in the world are caused by, one evil do in our society, a witch, or whatever, and whoever the witch is, the capitalists, the Jews, the white man, the patriarchy, whatever it is. You know what I mean by the witch? It's no, just the person you blame. The scapegoat. 
Hmm. And they say, okay, once we once we destroy the scapegoat, paradise will emerge. Now, some science fiction guys take the challenge of trying to invent what the laws and customs are that will create, that will eliminate the uh, institutional injustices, the systematic injustices of society. And starting with Thomas More, who just had, who proposed that the uh, the far island of Utopia, mm. uh, they don't have any private property, and they raise all of their children in dormitories, and they, uh, he he proposes the same republic as Plato's Republic, which perhaps should be listed as the first utopian writer, though I mm. think Plato was writing for a different purpose. I don't think he seriously meant to have any real republic set up like his, like his like his polity. I think he meant that as a, an elaborate metaphor, a model for human psychology. Yeah, human I soul. think so too. The golden part of the soul is reason. The, the, uh, the guardian part of the soul is the thumos, is the passions. And the appetitive part of the soul, the workmen, are the, are the appetites. And he, wanted, and he wanted to see the soul correctly ordered in order to find out what justice was. But be that as it may, there's some people who took Plato's ideas seriously. And the, uh, yeah. the, the Mayflower Compact, the Mayflower Pilgrims, when they first landed in the New World, tried to share all property in common. They tried that for, I think, two years, maybe three, and they Even were starving. And starved to death. <laughs> it worked so well, they starved to death. Right. And the did. governor yeah. who wrote up the history of the colony says in so many words, the dark conceit of Plato that men can live together and share all property in common is unworkable because if anyone could do it, we few band of, of religious uh, devotees could have done it because we are all honest men. And so if we can't do it, no one can. And I, I just have to agree with them. It's, it's impossible. You can't do it. Maybe yeah. in a monastery you can live without property, you know, but then again, the monastery has to exist surrounded by a society. Now, do you want to say monastic life is a utopia? It's more like, it's more like a sick ward because the people there are suffering from spiritual disease that they want to make, take extreme measures to cure through a life entirely devoted to prayer and good works and hard work. You know, or vows of silence or vows of obedience or really extreme vows, these monastics. So when you say utopias are a Christian uh, heresy, uh, hmm. I, have to, I have to agree, and I have to agree absolutely, because all Marx said is, hey, let's have everyone live a monastic life. And, or, excuse me, utopias will fall into one of two groups, in my opinion. The Spartan utopias, where they say, hey, let's all live like the Spartans did. Those guys are pretty kick-ass. <laughs> Yeah. They were pretty tough. They they fought off the Persians. <laughs> you know, let's let's swap wives, live with all property in common, have our kids raised by dorms, and have all seven year olds taken away and put into boot camp. And any children yeah. that don't please the elders of the tribe will throw into the apothete, into the pit on Mount Tigris. And by the way, modern apologists for the for the Spartans of all people are saying, Oh no, no, that's a that's a myth. That never actually happened. They were just that was just uh, Plutarch making that up. Uh, and they found the tiny little wee bones in the in the pit of the apothete. So, okay, so shove it, you apologists. You have no idea what you're talking about. The Spartans were really <laughs> tough guys, and they were really bad men. Okay, they were not. Yeah. So, uh, it was clear to me from reading his his Republic that Plato admired the Spartans, and it's also clear to me that Plato didn't realize that if he lived in Sparta, he would be one of the first guys who would be. You know, who would be th uh, Back put up the against hole. the wall to be shot as soon as they <laughs> yeah. invented the firearm. You know, so. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, in terms of why these things don't work, um, Eric S. Raymond, uh, open source devotee, libertarian, all sorts of things, had a very pithy one-line slogan that explains why, certainly Marxism, but most of these attempts at utopia will never work. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, love doesn't scale. And, yeah. this is what, and this is why you can have a family... Because families, in one sense, are um, very Marxist. They certainly embody the... Well, not, not at really, all. But, they are the well, exact opposite. The father the... owns everything and distributes his goods to his children because he loves them. The children don't own anything, but they don't work Fair either. Enough. But, but, it does embody the, but it does embody the Marxist slogan of from each according to their ability to each according to their need. That's that's what a family does. The family will look at the the parents will earn and will freely give to the children to support them and care for them so they can thrive. I mean, this is this is 
this is the pitch the Marxist is making. Sure. We, we, sure. we will we it's... will take we will take the love of the family and we will scale it to our whole society. And it doesn't work. I mean, like you'd think church. Well, it also doesn't work because it's not just a question of scale. The well, the Marxist is a wolf in sheep's clothing. So no true. matter how nice the sheep is, the idea of family life is a nice sheep. But the moment you say, let's have the government run by family life principles. Well, excuse me. If you actually wanted the government re- run on family principles, if you wanted the leader to be your father, then make him king. Kings are fathers to their nations, to their kingdoms, and people swear fealty to him and swear to obey him the way you obey a father. Or That's true. take the elder of your tribe, take the grandfather of your tribe, and treat him like a grandfather. That's what family life would actually be like. What Marx wants is what you said. He wants a system. No, he wants yeah, an intellectual true. rule. What he actually wants is a, is a Christian heresy. What he actually wants is the millennium. Okay. Yes. What he actually wants is to create the new Jerusalem uh, on Earth. And he even has a vision of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the uh, the Armageddon, the battle of the uh, the proletarian is going to rise up and destroy the capitalist, and the uh, the sons of light are going to be destroy destroy the sons of darkness. I mean, it's it's beat for beat. The Book of Saint John of the Apocalypse, you know, mm. including all the condemnations of the of the uh, capitalists as the whore of Babylon, uh, uh, he's just a Christian heretic. And he's then, trying to get Christianity without without Christ, you know. And, uh, and oh, excuse me, it'll, it'll it's a secular version. He, there's no God, it, also either. You know. And and after the battle, it will all fall away and become perfect, and the state will wither away, and we will yeah. live in communist happiness with everybody helping each other and then oh my goodness yeah doesn't work out like that in practice well i've often wondered i mean here's the other thing i've read and studied a lot of economists and marx is not an economist economists talk about things like like uh, trade deficits and marginal income tax rates and and the origin of money okay marx talks about a vision of the world as a hegelian dialectic of different social systems that clash with each other and collide and produce new systems out of the mutual destruction of the old systems and that the evolution, the Darwinian mm-hmm. evolution of, of destroyed socialist systems, social systems leads to ever better systems through no deliberate intervention of mankind. It's, it's an inevitable uh, uh, ecological process. And it's, um, it's a religious vision. Okay. Oh, of course. Because it is. Let me, because he says two things. First, he says that economies of scale, efficiencies of scale, will make it so that world monopolies are inevitable, and that all monopolies will combine into one huge super monopoly. Then he says that competition between wage earners makes it so that wages will continually go down until the wages are at their iron minimum, where you only give the guy enough to live on and to 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 uh, house himself. So every serf will be living in a cot, eating the minimum amount of gruel necessary to keep his, his thin body alive so he can work in the factory. Okay, so that's the progressive immiseration of the masses, otherwise known as the iron law of wages, and the, uh, the progressive trusts. Then he says, these things will build up a tension in society to the point where it will break. There will be an Armageddon, and then suddenly... Uh, Things will all be abundant. All goods and services will be abundant and can be distributed by a wise common will. The dictatorship of the proletariat will distribute all goods and services by need and each person will voluntarily produce all goods and services by by uh, his ability uh, so that they will get rid of wage, the iron law of wages by getting rid of wages. But all that would do is get rid of the you, you, you take a starving man's last bowl of gruel away. If he has no wages, he has nothing. And mm. if you get rid of the efficiencies of scale that are producing, that are allegedly producing the monopolies, by the way, monopolies are not created by efficiencies of scale, but let's just pretend they are for the sake of argument. Yeah. If, if efficiencies of scale led to monopoly, and then monopoly suddenly led to socialism, eliminating the monopoly, all that would do is reintroduce the inefficiencies. And if you eliminated private property you would eliminate the efficiency of specialization of labor. You'd have, have to have every man living like a tribesman, where in a primitive tribe, every, every adult male does every task every other adult male does. They all make their mm-hmm. own spears. They all hunt their own game. They all, they all are tent makers. They're all, you know, they all fire starters. They all do all the tasks. They're all warriors, and they're all, they're all fathers, and so on and so forth. 
but there's no but there's no specialization of labor. No one guy is better than another guy at any of the tasks, and they and they swap because now they can't swap. No one is secure in the fruits of his labor because all the all the fruits of labor go to the, go to the common store. So, Marx's idea is actually literally insane. It's the idea that the way you eliminate the problem is by eliminating the solution to the problem. Mm-hmm. You get rid of the disease by killing all the doctors. Well, it's not the way it works. You know, it, it doesn't. It can't work even in theory. It's a religious vision. It's not an economic theory as to how to how to reorganize society. But what it does do, like I said, the reason why it's a utopian vision is it says there's one devil. There's one thing that causes original sin. He says private property. And he says if you eliminate private property, he, I think he gets his idea from Rousseau. Rousseau thought that, that the primitive man living like the American, by which he meant the, the native, you know, American Indian, mm. uh, lives without property. He must not. He didn't. He didn't know any. <laughs> he no. didn't know many uh, any Sioux or Lenny Lenape. He didn't know any uh, Ojibwa. Uh, they had property. Okay. They also kept slaves. They also some of them tilled land. Okay. Be that as it may, Rousseau's idea was that property is what causes all injustice. And if you get rid of property, then people will just naturally, natively, happily, just be uh, all free men. All be uh, I don't know Tarzan living in the woods with their animal yeah. friends. <laughs> Of course, surrounded by obviously. the abundance of nature, just sipping so from the obvious. vine and uh, so on and so forth. It's a crazy idea. <laughs> of course it is. So if you want to talk into science fiction utopias, mm. not all of those are, are uh, socialist. And not all socialists believe Marx's vision. There was a guy called uh, Edward Bellamy who wrote a book called Looking Backward from 2000 to 1887. And his book was the first of, of many kind of socialist... Uh, uh, science fiction books, mm-hmm. uh, and basically the the plot is actually rather clever. There's a guy who's an insomniac who has to require a hypnotist to put him to sleep, and because noise keeps him awake, he sleeps in an underground uh, basement, a well ventilated, you know, uh, soundproof room. Mm-hmm. And on the day before he's 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 waiting to get married, but he can't get married because the working men are on strike in Boston, and he hates the working men and hates them being on strike. Uh, and it just so happens that as the hypnotist puts him to sleep, and the hypnotist has to go away for a trip or something, a fire collapses the building on top of him, and he's, he doesn't wake up until 110 years later when the guy who owns the land he's on is digging digging in his garden and, and, and comes across the, the buried room. And yeah. hypnosis in this system somehow prevents all cellular decay, so he's perfectly fine. And he wakes up, and the rest of the book is a series of lectures about how great socialism is. But in this background, the uh, the uh, main character, who's named Julian West, Julian West is taken to a rooftop and shown the glories of futuristic Boston. And only then does he actually believe that he's been asleep 100 years. And his first question about the future is, have you solved the labor, the labor question? And at that point, uh, the reason why I say the book is unreadable is because <laughs> no one waking up 100 years from now the first things out of his mouth would be, have you solved the labor question? And no one who was going to get married to his, his girl, Edith, uh, and he wakes up for 100 years and she's been dead 100 years, he was going to marry the girl and he's in love with her and he doesn't even mention her again for hundreds of pages. It turns out that the doctor who wakes up, Julian West, also has a daughter, also named Edith, who happens to look exactly like Edith. And surprise, plot twist, surprise ending, she turns out to be the great-great-granddaughter of Edith and they get married, you know. Now, I should say, the ending is actually cleverer than I give it credit for. The ending actually has him uh, waking up as if from a dream back in 1887, and he tries to convince the people around him that the way to solve the labor question is the way that future people solved it. They didn't have a revolution. The monopolies just got bigger and bigger due to efficiencies of scale, and then all the monopolies combined into one super monopoly, and the people just democratically took control of it without any fuss or bother. Without even any argument, because it was so obvious to the future people that there was not even any debate about the question. It just was inevitable, you see. So the doctor, okay. he's asked, how do you solve the labor question? He says, oh, it's, it's, not, it's not only easily solvable, but we can't even imagine what you guys, why you guys wanted to have private property. It doesn't make any sense to us, you know. Now, the guy has some kind of clever science fiction ideas, such as they don't use individualistic umbrellas when they go out into the rain. And the, uh, the future people are shocked, shocked that the society of 1887 would, would make it so that the weather would prevent people from going where they wanted to go. 
So instead, they have umbrellas unfold like awnings over the sidewalks to wherever you want to go. So it's like as, 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 a matter of, uh, as a matter of group planning. All the goods are stored in central warehouses and blown through pneumatic tubes, which I actually think is kind of cool, kind of, yeah, you know, awesome. kind of retro, retro <laughs> future, uh, to your house. And the guy's a good enough writer that he mentions that when Edith, future Edith, uh, had to go into the country for a while, it took three hours for the goods to arrive through the tube system, which was less well developed in the in the country because they haven't they haven't made all the branches and connections yet to the tube system. So when they go shopping, uh, Edith, uh, Julian West says to Edith, "Don't your clerks come to wait on you?" She says, "No, that would be very impertinent. Why would why would the clerk want to wait on me?" And he says, "Well, in my day, they tried to sell you goods." She says, sell us goods? Oh, my gosh. That would be outrageous. We just pick whichever goods we want. And, the, and, and West says, well, why, what if you have a question about the goods? She says, oh, no. The government prints up a card attached to every sample of the good, and we just read what the government says about the card, and, we, and the, the clerks don't even know what, what the, the goods are like. We don't have to order anything from them. All they have to do is be polite and take the order. And then they order the goods they need from the central warehouse, and it gets blown through a tube to your your house uh and again i just you just have to wonder well what happens if you want to walk in the rain to some place that's not covered by an awning and you don't have an mm. umbrella because you're your future guy what happens if you want to get some good that's not offered at in the central warehouse or you have a, some sort of special need or desire that they don't cover or you know how do they prevent people from ordering too much of something if it's if it's free uh, so on and so forth they also had music in the future they had a music group but the music room had the music piped in through telephone from various music halls where different programs were going on one after another after another all day. So you could hear different types of music just by phoning in from different locations. And you could change the volume of the music to fill your the acoustics of your music room by turning a screw. Which I thought was a really clever prediction as to how you know, volume insight, control yeah. knobs would work in the future. So... He, he wakes up in the past and tries to convince people that they have to evolve into socialists. And his people, including his girlfriend, Edith, all poo-poo him. And he's, he's, uh, he's terrified and horrified. And then he wakes up again and finds out that the dream he had of returning to the past was just a dream. And he's happily here in the future. And then he marries Edith, the future girl. The happy ending, you know. So it's actually, I mean, in, in terms of how, of how the, the lectures on socialism are framed, the lectures are stupid. <laughs> and everything is done in that really heavy-handed way where all the socialists talk as if no other possible point of view can even be entertained except by crazy people to their simple solution to all of life's complex ills, you see. Of course. And the reason why the solutions are so simple is because, like you said, they're trying to solve the problem through an institution, through, through a technique, through the wandering of power. Okay? They're not trying to solve the errors of the human soul. The, the guy does not even bring up uh, what do the people from, what do you do with people who are from the clockwork orange future if they step into your future and they're just youths with too much with too much joy, juice in them who want to go out and commit crimes and, and molest women. I mean, what, what do you do with those people? Yeah. Okay, what do you do with, with, the, with the greedy who, if the goods are free, they, they eat, they get too much? Well, I mean, you know, do you have the government regulate that? Okay, well, who regulates the regulators? How do you ration it? Yeah. Yeah. Goods, see, goods need to be produced. Rationing, ra in real life, rationing just produces shortages. That's why the yeah. gas rationing under the, in the Carter administration here in America just produced a gas shortage. And the, the, the rationing was supposed to be a reaction to a shortage. So it just made matters worse. And any economist worth a salt could have told you that was going to happen. Hmm. You see? Because what, what happens when you ration things is the Carter administration gives just as much gas to California as it does to Utah. And in Utah, they have less need of gas than California does. But if they both get the same amount and they can't, and the Utah Utahese cannot sell it to the Californians, they use it to heat their pools. Whereas hmm. the Californians only, can only drive on odd numbered days because they don't have any gas in their cars. See the problem with rationing? Oh, pr hmm. prices ration things effectively. I mean, that's one of the insights of The Economist. It's definitely yeah. true. Yeah. And other attempts to ration things don't work as well. Don't work as well. And you talked, uh, about, you talked about scaling up from a family. A father, yeah. even if he has 10 children, can usually keep track of what their needs are. Hmm. But not a dormitory leader who has uh, 100 charges or 1,000 in his 
door. How are you going to keep track of that? Hmm. You know? Maybe the yeah. supercomputer could do it. Maybe Multivac could do it. There are science fiction proposals of having uh, computers run, run the world for us. I, I had a similar thing in one of my stories. Now, my, my utopia was a libertarian utopia. L. Neil Smith also writes a, a one or two libertarian utopias. And basically, the libertarians are the opposite of the Marxists. They think an insufficient number of private property, too much government, they say, is the, is the cause of the problem. So, so pare back the government to the absolute minimum, and the problems will get pared back to an absolute minimum. So that's, that's their theory. Well, i gotta, I got to be honest. Certainly the problems we have today are definitely... The problems we have today are definitely not caused by an excess of libertarianism. Yes. Oh, no, I agree. If I, <laughs> if I had a choice between which dysutopia to go into, the libertarian dysutopia or the, uh, or the socialist dysutopia, I'll pick libertarian any time. Because you know? hmm. they won't stop me from going into the wilderness with, with my own gun and my own, you know, my own harpoon and, and, and uh, you know, killing a whale and then make myself a tent out of whale blubber in the Arctic or whatever. They, they, they'll leave me alone, the libertarians. Hmm. Now, the only problem with the libertarian utopia is that that uh, libertarianism doesn't have a sufficiently cohesive society to produce the next generation of libertarians. You have to have everyone agree to a certain set of gentlemanly principles of leaving each other alone to have a libertarian society. Otherwise, the the busybodies, you know. So in libertarian societies, it's a great society if you're young, male, not in an emergency and not at war. Okay, but what do you do with all the women folk? I mean, don't 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 they want to be busybodies and meddle with other people <laughs> and to help other people meddle with their neighbor's business? You know, mm. so a sexist would say, <laughs> if I could borrow a joke from Greg, Greg Gutfeld. Yeah. So, so what do we do with? Um, so we're trying to build these paradises. What do you make of um, something like Aldous Huxley's um, Brave New World? I Alice mean, Huxley's place, Brave New World is a work a of, nightmare, but you know, it's a work of know. genius because his utopia is the opposite of the 1984 of George Orwell. Hmm. Orwell's utopia was basically what if the Soviet Union came to came to uh, Britain within the next 40 years? He wrote in 1948. Hmm. That's why the book is written, is, is 1984. At the time, hmm. it was a far future year. Okay, uh, and all he did was take all the Soviet ticks and mannerisms he saw and apply them to the British, you know. And the fact that he his predictions are so eerily prescient yeah. is only because he had a good insight into human nature. Now, he himself, I believe, was a socialist. I think he was still deceived by he, the, yeah, he was. by the falderall and the the, uh, the hornswoggle of of socialism. But Aldous Huxley, I think, had a slightly deeper insight. His insight was that the luxuries produced by scientific society, if turned against man's nature itself, with things like conditioning, genetic uh, manipulation of the unborn, and so on, would produce his caste system of alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon people, uh, and would produce a society so thoroughly devoted to its own pleasure, including sexual pleasure, that basically everyone would be addicted to soma. Everyone would be would be a drug addict, mm. and would be kept pleasant, pleasurable, and and uh, doped up to happiness. Um, and would just be uh, uh, a soulless. It, it his his story was was uh, the happy ending version of Faust, where you make a deal with the devil and you and you get everything. You get everything the devil has to offer. But the devil again can only offer externals, wealth. In, in the case of in the case of uh, Brave New World, uh, sex, soma, pleasure, food, uh, work, because the people still there had, still had to work. Uh, and uh, the feelies, the movies were uh, were there to, to distract you. And the one guy uh, who had been raised on a, I believe on an Indian reservation and therefore did something like Christianity couldn't okay, stand it, could not tolerate the, the the utopia. It was it was it was. Uh, hell to him, and he committed suicide at the end. It would be hell. The place is a nightmare. The place is a nightmare, that, sure. The, the fact that no the inhabitants human... don't realize it is just slightly more horrific in a lot of ways. Like, well, yeah, I, I not, agree they've stopped being human beings. They're not human. 
and, and the thing could not actually work because even in even in Aldous Huxley, even with all the psychological conditioning, he proposes that people would not form permanent sexual bonds. Okay, people wouldn't get married in his future. They they just they swap wives like the Spartans did. Well, okay, that's not going to happen. It'll happen to a lot of people when they're young. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, Another they... dystopia, which I think is actually makes more sense than Aldous Huxley's, because Aldous Huxley's utopia could only last a few years. Human nature would reassert itself. What do you do when the youths from Clockwork Orange show up in your in your city of pure pleasure? You know, mm. uh, if you saw the movie uh, Demolition Man. You know yes. how the police in Utopia would deal with a real criminal if a real criminal show up. They ask him politely to stop, and they look in their little their little notebook to see what they're supposed to do if the guy says no, and the guy laughs at them and then shoots them, you know, in the in the, in the kneecap and stuff. So it's it's a by the way it's a great movie if you it want to talk about what's wrong was, with Utopias. It was a goofy film back at the time, but today it just looks prescient. Oh no, it's it's horrifyingly it had it had it's a great it. film. It was, it was it's a fun movie. It was oracular, yes, yes. Uh, so, but Atlas Huxley, I just thought was was unrealistic. Even if you, even if you gene therapied some people to be idiots, to be epsilons, and even if you shocked electroshocked babies so they didn't want to read books or play with flowers, uh, and, and conditioned them that way, and used all your techniques, those techniques work to a degree, okay. Mm. But the human nature is something that can't be controlled because it's internal. It's, it's spiritual. There are still people who would have higher ideals that you can't, you can't smother with pleasure. There are, uh, there are people who always will want to... There's a human impulse that even among non-Christians, it's not just a Christian impulse to go into a cave and pray and to get your, to get your life straight and to uh, eschew bodily pleasures, that you regard bodily pleasures as disgusting. Okay, The pagans had that. The, 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 the Romans had their Vestal Virgins. The the uh, the Hindus and the uh, the Middle Easterners are famous for their for their ascetic practices, and the Chinese as well. They, that's part of human nature. If you can't address the part of human nature that is disgusted with human nature, you don't know what you're doing. You can't keep everyone just drugged up and happy. It's not going to work. For one thing, who's giving the drugs to everyone? You know, is, are none of these people going to be dissatisfied? Who are the alphas who are running running the society? Are none of them going to be ambitious? Are none of them going to think that they could? tweak society a little bit and make it slightly better uh you see the problem are none of them going to be uh possessed of wrath or greed or you know maybe they won't be possessed of lust because apparently in the uh in the brave new world everyone gets as many as many women as he likes who are all pneumatic described as pneumatic by the way um no it wouldn't work it wouldn't work for the same reason that the 1984 would not work now when i say don't work i mean eventually fall apart the soviet union also didn't work because it eventually fell apart. But I have an insight into that, which I get from Ronald Reagan, which is this. If the West had not been propping it up for as long as it did, it would have fallen apart a lot sooner. You see? You can't really run a utopia unless there's a non-utopian world outside that's giving you money and it's giving you help. You know, if you didn't have if you didn't have Americans investing in China, China would be as as, as poor as a church mouse. Without a church, because they're atheists. You see? Um... Yeah. Uh, and Marx knew this, uh, excuse me, Lenin knew this. He said, the capitalists will sell you the rope needed to, to tie a noose off for them. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll, sell, they'll sell you the hangman's rope. So, Albus Huxley, I thought, did a brilliant job of doing a uh, the opposite utopia from George Orwell. Because one was just based on uh, fear and power, the way, uh, I guess you would say, a, a Nazi utopia. And the other was based on pleasure and uh, commodities, uh, on personal freedom, you know. But it was a scientifically run society. So how free are they if they're conditioned to only to use the freedom in a certain way? Every, yeah. There's no moral rules, but there's there's somehow you all kind of do the same thing because you've been electroshocked as babies not to like books and to, and to listen to orders, you know. And everyone's raised. Now, in, in terms of science fiction, I, ha- I uh, read uh, The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin when I was young. That proposes that there's two planets orbiting around each other, Uras and, uh, uh, and Ares. And one of them is an evil capitalist society, and the other one is a benevolent anarchist society. Mm-hmm. And the anarchists share all property in common, and they raise all their children by, uh, in dormitories. No one has any families, and no one has any personal life. 
and all the children are assigned names by a computer and uh, they share they all starve together or share property together and the uh, the main character Shevek the mathematician uh, is a genius and, and discovers a method of uh, faster than light communication but because there's no intellectual for property on on in utopia there's no way he could patent the invention or make it he'd have to there's no way to get someone to, to do a new project. There's no way to build a new factory. Now, thinking about her utopia, when, when I read it as a kid, I didn't see the problem with it. I just kind of, you know, I assumed it, it was meant to be taken seriously. But looking back as a grown-up, I just go, well, why does anyone do anything in that in that society? If they don't get paid for their work, why do they work? If they don't get any personal benefit from it, why do they... Why don't they just call in sick every day and you, you have might needs? To do something, and the more, the greater their choose. needs. Are. Why? Why doesn't it work like the 20th century motor car company from Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged? In Ayn Rand's parable, she said, if you tried to run a car company by Marxist principles, all that would happen is, if everyone was rewarded by need, is the people would just get needier and needier, and if everyone was re- was penalized by work, if more work was piled onto the people who were harder workers the number of hard workers would, would diminish and diminish. Yep. And people would who otherwise got along with each other would start hating each other. If you saw, if you were, uh, saw a, if your neighbor was uh, pregnant, uh, if your neighbor's wife was pregnant, you saw that as another mouth you had to feed. But, you see, so your work would increase. So you would not want her to carry through with her to term. Say? Yep. And, and so on. So the, the motor car company quickly goes out of, quickly goes out of business in, in the uh, Ayn Randian uh, parable. Well, the entire planet of, of uh, uh, Inaris, or uh, I might be confusing the names of the two planets. Yep. Uh, the entire utopia planet, the, the entire desert planet, would nothing would get done. And why would it? And why would the people who don't have any family life feel any loyalty to the, uh, I don't know who, the voluntary commissars? who run their society. Now, Ayn Rand, uh, excuse me, believe that, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin was wise enough to propose that there was some corruption going on in her in her utopia, that it wasn't perfect, that some of the commissars were uh, were self-serving and others were not as enlightened as they should be. And so he, uh, and so the anarchist goes to the other planet and tries to get his invention sold there, and he runs into some revolutionaries on that planet, he tries to help the revolution and it, and it backfires on the revolution is not going to happen on that on the, in the capitalist planet. But the whole thing was so simplistic and so childish that even if she was talking about even if she were talking about non-humans, you could mm-hmm. nothing could work that way. It just doesn't. It's like you could putting water in your gas tank is cheaper than putting in gasoline, but it won't run. No, it's that's not the way to solve the problem. The way to solve the problem of poverty is by Getting rid of property, but the problem of property—the problem of poverty—is that you don't have enough property. That's the problem of poverty. So the solution is not to well, I—I uh, I, I don't know what to say. The solution—the solution to, uh, I said it before. The solution to sickness is not to get rid of all the doctors. It's not to get rid of the solution of the problem. That that causes more of the problem, not less. Hmm. So there's a Ursula K. Le Guin's utopia, which is just. She at least was realistic enough to know that it would have problems. It would be perfect. But it was ridiculous, nonetheless. Now, do you want to say that Star Trek, when it first came out, was utopian because it had all the races of Earth getting along on the Star Trek Enterprise? I don't think they had war or poverty on Earth. I think they had solved those problems. They they actually addressed that in um, Deep Space Nine when they're fighting with the Founders and the Founders come to Earth and... They deploy the military everywhere, or they deploy Star- Starfleet security everywhere, and they say we've destroyed paradise. I don't know. Is is the is Earth and sort of the inner systems of um, the Federation some sort of semi utopian paradise? They all seem to serve on the Enterprise as some sort of higher calling. They don't get paid to do the job. Well, they're military officers. I assume they get a wage. No, so that's the problem. No. I don't think I, I I haven't seen enough of the Star Trek shows. I I, I watched the original series, and I watched uh, Next Gen, and I watched uh, Deep Space Nine, mm. but I don't think I saw enough of it to know what the future of Earth was exactly supposed to be. I don't know what civilian life is supposed to be. 
Is civilian life just you get a free pension from the government and then you live on a holodeck? You know, among I, your <laughs> well, well, this is it. I among mean, your um, among your many among your many uh, uh, Orion slave women. You know, what else I'm, we get I'm a dial sure. holodeck to do? Well, in yeah. Deep Space Nine, they they go back. Uh, Cisco and Jake go back to Earth to visit um, Cisco's dad, and he runs a shop in I think it's in New Orleans, and he runs like a gumbo um, restaurant. Yeah. Um, well, I believe Picard's but, brother runs a uh, is oh, a, is runs a, a winery, bit, runs a and yeah. runs a vine, uh, uh, runs a farm in uh, France. But why would you? Well, I, see, I don't know. If you have food I mean, that's the thing. It, 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 yeah, I mean, like can't running you just a restaurant, get food out of by plugging it by plugging it into a wall socket. Well, but running a restaurant is hard work. Running a vineyard is hard work. I'm sure some people enjoy that sort of thing, but you know, it doesn't. It doesn't seem like. It doesn't seem like the sort of thing a lot of people would do. Um, for no reward, or yeah. for the reward of, you know making people happy <laughs> well picard when he wakes up a uh when he wakes up a capitalist from the 20th century he, he actually says that they've got rid of money on earth which oh yes which i think no, is ridiculous maybe you could get rid of money in the in the services and have everything run by credit or something from a central bureaucracy if you were the military but you can't get rid of money because you need some method of rationing resources and well, even if you don't call it money you need something you, know. you need a medium of exchange. Well, they have that because they're um, in in um, in the next generation when they're sitting around playing poker. Um, they're they're playing poker for replicator rations. <laughs> <laughs> for ration I mean, yeah. is is that or is that not money? I mean, you know, like, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, this is this is effectively money. You're not playing for nothing. You're, you're not at playing least for in Star Trek. Sticks. It was never. I, I would not call that utopian literature. Because at least in Star no. Trek, they still have wars and adventures. You may just have to leave Earth to to do it, you know. But I can imagine. I mean, I can imagine that you could get a future where there are fewer wars or even none for a time, merely because there are places on Earth where there have been few wars or none for a time. Mm. There's never been a time on Earth when there was no war anywhere on the globe, and there's never been a nation that didn't have uh, wars every uh, twenty or fifty years or so. And those are the peaceful nations, the warlike nations. Back in the day, the Assyrians went to war every summer. It was their law. They were not. They were required to go to war every uh, every summer. You say. Uh, but could you have a future without war? A world government of some sort. Uh, the Martians could land and just impose peace, like they do in uh, in Childhood's End by uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Mm. Now, there's an interesting question for you: Is that a utopia? Because in Arthur C. Clarke. After the aliens, the overlords land, uh, they impose peace on Earth, take control, stop, uh, I believe they stop all um, uh, bullfighting in Spain. I don't know what they do for the rest of the animals. I, I, maybe they free all the animals, I don't know. I don't remember the, the book well enough. And they take charge of mankind because mankind is on the verge of undergoing an evolutionary uh, next step. To we're gonna our children are gonna be psychic and are going to uh, create mass minds and live together without clothing uh, and, and then fly off into the universe as as uh, into the into the pleroma of the of the Gnostics or something something. But during those few years when there's no war, it's imposed by a superior race. I don't know if anyone considers that to be utopian literature. I don't remember there being any of the convulsions or turmoils I would expect from Mad Max and people trying to fight off the aliens and Arthur C. Clarke, the aliens are just too powerful. Now yep. this is even after we discovered the aliens look like bat-winged, horned devils from the from mm. the uh, carvings of a, of a cathedral on, on uh, uh, you know, of a, of a medieval cathedral. And the devils then produce a magic TV, which they park, I believe, in the basement of the Oxford University, that you can look backward through time and see that Christ was a fraud and that will just show everyone that religion is, is nonsensical. And in Arthur C. Clarke, they all give up on religion within a week or two of mm. finding out uh, of finding out that all religions are fraud. Without any fuss. Everyone does. The Pope, the Imams, Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible Answer Man, you know, all the radio preachers, 
everyone who's only hope and consolation on their sick bed is in Christ. We all just give it up. There's no no religion in. Okay, is that utopian literature? It has some of the heavy handedness and simplicity of utopian literature. Some of the uh-huh. ideas that your stupid, simple answer is going to solve all problems. Let me pause to make fun of my friends as libertarians, because I wrote a libertarian utopia. <laughs> it was called The Golden Age. And they didn't yep. give me the Prometheus Award. They gave it to uh, J.R.R. Tolkien instead for that year. Even though he was a guy who believed in divine kingship, he believes a monarchist of the old school monarchist. No, so don't, I'm not sure why he got it instead of me. But I'm not burning with jealousy, because, no, of course, here now that I live in utopia, well, I don't have those emotions anymore. Uh, in any case, I wrote a libertarian utopia. But I also wrote it, libertarians are a little more realistic than communists, uh, a little. Because they at least would say there's always going to be flaws, there's always going to be shortcomings, there's always going to be limitations. Yep. Without those limitations, you can't have an economy. You can't have, you don't have economics unless there's scarcity of resources, for example. Yeah. Even if you've discovered a longevity drug or some means of produ- pre- preserving your life in a transhumanist uh, future where you can make your mind... Uh, infinite in uh, by downloading into a, a machine that lasts thousands of years. Eventually, those thousand years are going to be up. Eventually, the 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 second law of thermodynamics is going to get the better of you. We'll Entropy the always end. wins in the end. That was the point of my libertarian utopia. As I said, it's not going to it's not going to work forever. It would be a golden age. It would be a great age, sure, if you if you got rid of the institutional barriers to progress. Uh, and I just also assumed that there would be immense moral progress, and that all people on Earth would voluntarily, I said, okay, it takes place half a million years in the future when people have been living with computer nannies for a long time and the computers, of course, being perfectly logical and having no flaws and no emotions. Just like the Asimov robots just all run everything, you know, perfectly well. Just, they're just, they're mm. just flawless at their, uh, at their, um, uh, they're as flawless as the psychohistorians of the second foundation of Isaac Asimov. Mm-hmm. The rulers who secretly run everything and don't disagree with each other. That was the other thing I liked about the overlords of uh, Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood End. The aliens land and rule the earth for our benefit and for the benefit of our children to come. But they don't quarrel with each other. <laughs> you see? Because, I mean, because mm. the, the story is about uh, make-believe. The story, the story is about something which is not going to happen. No. So in order to have you, in order even to to have a thought experiment about utopia, which I had in my book, is I just had to assume that everyone would be uh, as polite and correct as the British at their best, you know. Mm-hmm. And I say this as an American: we 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 don't like the British at their best. We uh, <laughs> we broke away from them during one of the more civilized periods of of human history, you know. Yep. So, and then we created America, which is a utopia. So come here to America, but don't sneak in. Because we have laws. Well, yeah. So. Hey, what do you mean? Uh, just yesterday, we abolished the differences between the sexes. So now everyone's equal in America. Did, did you hear about that? Sure. Also, all pronouns are now are now going to be replaced by grunts or something. So it's everything. Everything's <laughs> not perfect. And, and uh, money is going to be free, and we'll owe nothing, and we'll eat bugs. And you'll it's, be happy. Apparently. And we'll be happy. It's the part about being happy I like the best. Now, would you rather live in that place or in the Latveria of Doctor Doom? In the Latveria of Doctor Doom, canonically, according to uh, Jack King Kirby, Doctor Doom's robots will come around to your house if you're a Bavarian peasant and make sure you're happy because they will kill you if you're not or, or use their hypno rays on you. So everyone is happy in Doctor uh, Doom's Latveria. He is the perfect ruler. It's a utopia. Um, clearly, I mean, that sounds like the utopia of the paranoia role playing game where. <laughs> <laughs> uh, friend computer we're happy territory <laughs> and everyone is taken care of by friend computer the unfortunately computer alpha is complex is um threatened by commie mutant traitors in the original edition and in the more recent run terrorist mutant traitors but um, oh they lose a lot of flavor if they're no longer common mutant traitors that's terrible. i know well that's that's okay but that's a bit it's a bit of a dated reference now so the computer, the computer demands you... that you report any traders immediately to the computer. Have you reported yes. to the computer today? <laughs> any mutants must be reported to the computer. Spreading rumors that mutants exist is treason. treason. Have you committed treason today? The computer is pre- mandatory. Oh, I think I think paranoia is, is a wonderful game. Oh yes, it's a, it's wonderful, a wonderful utopia. Satire. Yes, it's it's a it's a great um, 
It's a great take on the genre. Because that's anyway, what it would really be like. You know? Yeah. <laughs> that's the problem. Um, that's that's a best case of what it would be like. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a best case. <laughs> yes. Um, so Utopia, obviously a dream, a Christian heresy. Yep. So how do we prevent Utopia? Would we want to? Well, we probably would want yes, to. Yes, we absolutely would prevent Utopia. It always ends in blood get, and fire. The, the Utopia is killing the goose to get the gold out of the... the it's killing the goose to get the gold in it. It's, it's trying true. to produce human virtue by means of external rewards and punishments. And it doesn't work. It, and it doesn't work. Not only does it not work, it's counterproductive. You get the opposite. Mm. Marx and Lenin and Stalin promised... Uh, prosperity to the Russian people if they modernized under a communist system. They owned all property mm. in common. No, not all property, excuse me, just, just the major sources of, of industry. And instead they got nightmarish horrors and mass death camps and the gulags and grinding poverty. Instead they got famine. Okay? Famine had not happened in, in Europe in, 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 since the mid Middle Ages. Well, yes, I, I did hear it say it's impressive they managed to get famine in uh, Russia, which has some of the most fertile and growable earth on earth on the in, planet. In the, like, in the Ukraine, the soil is so rich it is as black as chocolate as as, uh, as coffee yeah. grounds, and if you stick a broom into the soil, it will sprout in a in a week. Okay, <laughs> it is the most fertile soil. It is the most rich place on the on the continent and they for growing the famine. Things. So how do you get a famine there? Well, you get it through communism. Bureaucracy. You get it. Well, <laughs> Stalin took the food from people who would not support him and gave it to the people who would support him. Yeah. So that, so that, and, and then the uh, New York Times reported that it didn't happen. That's, that's oh. what we, that's what we now call gaslighting. Okay. Yes, from the New York people. Times. Because they were on their side. So the, 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 the utopia is a, is a, is a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's a Always. false promise. And I think the way to avoid it is to read stories about Utopia. Read 1984. Read uh, Ralph Bellamy's Looking Backward. Read uh, uh, Atlas Huxley. And you'll see what you're actually getting in for. See, Now, don't watch Star Trek or Childhood's End or any of those other books I mentioned because they don't point out what the problems would inevitably be. They will lie be. to you. Say again? They will lie to you. Yeah, they'll just lie. They'll just say, and everyone will get along and be happy. And then why, well, why would, I mean, why would Cain be happy in that situation if he's jealous of his brother Abel? Does jealousy suddenly stop in your utopia? And if they say, yes, jealousy stops because all men own all property in common, I go, well, that's not what causes jealousy. There's, the sin of jealousy still exists in families where all the property is owned by the father. The sin of jealousy still exists in kibbutzes. The, the utopia is, no, excuse me, to do better, Read up on the history of, let's say, Ohio. There were a number of utopias. There were a number of, of colonies, communist mm -hmm. colonies that were set up under different, slightly different theories of communism uh, between the Civil War and, and the uh, Great War and, and World War One in America. <laughs> and all of them lasted about a year or less, except for one or two. They usually they usually started around a very charismatic leader. Uh, he usually ended up sleeping with a lot of women and taking away all their money. And they all they all ended up like the Plymouth colony. If you want to get rid of Utopia, you have to read history. And the Utopians know this. That's why they need control of the public school system, so that no one reads any history. See, mm. and so they can make sure that 1984 and, and Brave New World are not on the are not on the curriculum. Not on the reading list. Yeah. Not on the reading list. Right. So. So the answer is get control of the public schools. Homeschool. Yep. Uh, the uh, the teachers' unions cannot be reformed. Nuke the site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. So the way to the way to avoid the false promise of utopianism or of the, of the utopia is to read a little history and, and become a Christian because otherwise or, because Christianity will satisfy your desire, your craving for paradise, which in utopia you can't you can't be satisfied. These people are luring people in by telling them. That the paradise of the Christians never exist, never can exist. It's the New Jerusalem's not coming, mm. and so but the human heart yep. still craves perfection. We're still built for eternity. 
Yep. So they, they want to produce an Irzatz eternity, a utopia that will last forever. I notice none of these utopian societies in the books ever are going to be a hundred years of utopia. And then there'll be a war. Except for mine. Golden Age ends with the Golden Age ending in a war. Uh-huh. Just by the way. Because I don't believe in <laughs> utopia. So my utopia is not a utopia that I wrote. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't last. It's really a wealthy it's really a wealthy commonwealth. Is it? Well, on that note, read your books because that will uh, <laughs> disabuse you. So, well, thank you, John, for joining us today. And uh, for everyone who's listening, like, share and subscribe. I uh, hope you're enjoying the content and let us know what we can do better. Thanks. Good evening. Thank you.